absolutely unfamiliar. I promise you that by the end of the evening, uh, you will know more. But I want to start off with a special welcome to our Consul General from Israel, David Levy, who is here with us tonight, and also to the MP from Mount Royal, Anthony Housefather, who is here with us tonight, as well as our own members who we will be featuring and celebrating. And so let's Let's start the evening with song, with joy. We'll start with the Nigun, for which you need absolutely no words, just your voice, your spirit, your heart. <laughs> Thank you. 
come up and light the candles with and for us, please. Let's read together on page three. As these Shabbat candles give light to all who behold them, so may we by our lives give light to all who behold us. As their brightness reminds us of the generations of Israel who have kindled light, so may we in our own day be among those who kindle light. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who hallows us with his folk, commanding us to kindle the light of Shabbat. So just before we welcome the messengers, the angels of Shabbat on page 24, Van Katha, uh, take a moment to welcome the person next to you. If you don't know them, all the better. Please introduce yourself and wish them a Shabbat
in Korea or whether it's here at home. And I think about in all of it how many things we don't we don't know, right? Whether what we worry about will be what our grandchildren worry about or something different. I often when I read Rabbi Stern's sermons from a generation ago, I'm struck by how many of the crises of the day were exactly that. They were crises of the day and they came and went as many of ours have and will. And how many are those enduring concerns of what it means to be a human being living in the world. And it strikes me that as much changes and as much stays the same, one of the things that we, I think, or at least certainly I come here for every week, is a sense of what's timeless and a sense that part of that timelessness is hopefulness, is this sense that however history moves, that we are on this long, perhaps slow, perhaps, trajectory that gets us ultimately to somewhere real, somewhere better, and a place of more togetherness, a place of more peace. And so it's with that in mind that we come to this Michamoka. And the reading on page 41, it vexes me a little because it speaks very much of, of peace. And the Michamoka is not a song that comes from a time of peace. It comes from a time of conflict, of the Israelites escaping the Egyptians and crossing the Sea of Freedom and the Egyptians drowning in the water. It was not exactly a um, bucolic or ironic time. But this reading, I think, combined with this song, brings together that hopefulness for peace, for redemption, for freedom, not just for our people, but for all people. So I'm going to ask you to join me in the reading on 41, and then we'll sing on page 40 together. Sing the song of men and women, join in understanding and respect. The song of God's miracles, an earth protected and cherished, a giver for our children and the generations to come. The song of the land once ravaged by war, now quiet and content. Her soldiers home need no more. The song of the world redeemed, the song of the peace.
go forth. Prepare for us as we return. Spread over us your shelter of peace over all we love, over our Jerusalem and yours. Baruch atah Adonai, hapores yukat shalom, aleinu ve'akol amo Yisrael, ve'al Yerushalayim. Hapon Katla 44, Vishamir. So, 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 so,
page 57, we turn to, to the English, one of the versions of the Ritze prayer. And we pass through this one often quickly. It's between the opening of the Amidah and the, the prayers for gratitude and peace, which we tend to zoom in on. Uh, but I want to spend a moment on this one tonight because this is a prayer that really speaks to the connection between Israel and the rest of the Jewish world, to this notion that we always have this connection to the place of our origin, to the place for millennia of our yearning, to the place that is now a reality for us, <clears throat> even as we offer our prayers as we are, from where we are deeply rooted in our own homes. And so I'm going to invite us, those who are familiar or willing to take a chance with the Hebrew, to do so with me, and then into the English at the top of 57. We'd say, Adonai Eloheinu, Be'amchai Yisrael, Utfilatam De'avat Be'am, Utihi L'ratzon Tami, Avodat Yisrael Amen. Baruch Atah Adonai, She'otchal Bacham, Yir'ah Na'avot. Ever-present one, may we, your people Israel, be worthy in our deeds and our prayers. Wherever we live, wherever we see you, in this land, inside the store, in all lands, you are our God, who alone we serve in prayers. Baruch atah Adonai, shalom v'atavah, v'yar ha'avot. We continue with gratitude, 59 together. God of goodness, we give thanks for the gift of life, wonder beyond words, the awareness of soul, our life within, the world around us so filled with beauty, the richness of the earth, which made the day sustains us. For all these and more, we offer thanks. Baruch atah Adonai, atol shikhal, u'lechalai elevotot. Page 60, our prayer for peace. We'll stop.
And so I arrived in Ben Gurion Airport at the end of June, I suppose it was. And just out of interest, who here has been to Israel before? Raise a hand. All right. So the vast majority of people in the room, that's pretty fabulous. And those who did not raise your hands, take comfort. I'll take that as a not yet, rather than a no. Um, so assuming most of you didn't take the boat, uh, you know the experience of Ben Gurion Airport, right? And so I landed at the end of June last summer, and um, it's not especially Canadian the way the lines work to go through <laughs> customs, right? In fact, there there are no lines. There's kind of this this press of people. I kind of see the world as a spectrum when I think of the places that I that I've lived in. England's over here in terms of how the culture works, and and Israel's over there, and New York's probably here closer to Israel, and Montreal is somewhat closer to England. If you've been to these places, you, you see the picture I'm painting. So there was a crush of people, which was not surprising, and in fact quite wonderful. I was speaking to our Consul General earlier today, and you mentioned we had more tourists to Israel last year than, than ever. So it felt like all of them were there with me in Ben Gurion. So it was very crowded. They were, many of them, very young, which again, with the advent of birthright trips to Israel, is, is not, so, um, not so surprising. I have to say, among the many things for which I admire Israel is their ability to take thousands of teenagers from North America each summer and still operate as a stable society. <laughs> um, I, I feel like that's no small thing. I don't know if I can do it. Um, but, so those things weren't unusual, right? There were a lot of people, there were a lot of young people. The unusual thing, I will tell you, is that they were tall. I was surrounded by young, tall, after a transatlantic flight, sweaty Jews. And I noticed this because I was basically at armpit height. <laughs> and this was when I realized that it was a Maccabiya summer in Israel. So you will hear more about Maccabia over the next few moments, and I, I don't want to take away from the introductions, but I will share that the, that the idea for this evening was born not in that precise moment, but when I came back and discovered that we have a very, um, a very humble yet accomplished celebrity among us in terms of Maccabia, and that is Roy Salomon, our member who 
participated in the Canadian basketball team at the Maccabee Games in 1969, and has had an involvement spanning to present day, including carrying the world flag in the opening ceremonies in last year's Maccabee game in 2017. And I, I have to add, Roy, with your permission, that you have also been a member at Temple since even before you were on that basketball team in 1969. Um, and so I realized that we have someone here who has been part of an extraordinary and little known phenomenon of the Maccabee Games. And those who go and are part of it are tremendously impacted and others of us might not know so much. So tonight, as we are close to the 70th English anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel, of May 14, 1948, uh, it seemed like it would be a wonderful opportunity to, to learn, to hear, to share, to celebrate. And that is precisely what we're going to do for the next little bit. And so um, I have the pleasure of, in a moment, calling up Laurie Salomon, who's, believe me, if I were to share all of his accolades, we'd be here for an hour, but also he might not forgive me. And so I'll ask you, Laurie, to forgive me for not sharing all of those. But it really is, is quite an extraordinary story in terms of the breadth and depth of your involvement. Roy will introduce um, two of our next speakers. And then you may be wondering to yourselves, well, where are these young athletes? We planned this evening with them in mind, but lo and behold, when you're in your late teens and 20s, you tend to not plan your life a year in advance. It's a funny thing that happens. And so one of them is currently in Israel on birthright. The other is currently in Cuba. Um, but I will read some words from Chloe Gordon, who is a Maccabee competitor from Temple. Um, who is currently in Israel, and Luca Hollinger, who is now in Cuba. His mom, Heidi, is going to be sharing some words from her son as well. Let's begin with Roy. Thank you very much, Rabbi, for your more than kind words. Consul General, Member of Parliament Anthony Hausfather, and fellow members of Temple. Uh, it was really a pleasure hearing from the rabbi and mentioning that we were going to have a Maccabee Games evening. And that's uh, the only danger of that is once I start talking about Maccabee, I go on and on and on. So I'll try to keep it short. Um, and of course, we do have some interesting things to talk about. In 1969, I really had the pleasure and the honor of being a member of the Canadian basketball team at the Maccabee Games in Ramat Gan. When I marched into the stadium with our team, I don't want to call it an epiphany because it's a little bit too strong, but really it was a special time in all of our lives. I looked around that stadium and I saw 40,000 Jewish brothers and sisters watching all the teams from various countries march into that stadium. And I thought back and I thought of the Inquisition, I thought of the pogroms, I thought of the Holocaust and how we were to be destroyed. But here we were in Israel, stronger than ever, prouder, proud of our Israeli brothers and sisters for what they had done. It was truly amazing to us, to the point that we decided, we had some young, so-called younger people at the time, that when we came back to Canada, that we wanted to become involved. We wanted to become involved and give this experience to as many Jewish athletes in Canada as possible. And that's what we did. I don't know if any of you remember the names of Joey Richmond, Fred Oberlander, two great athletes, two people who were very involved in Maccabi. And some of the younger people came back and we sort of asked permission if we could get involved. And they were more than happy to have us involved in the organization. Um, it's been a very special trip all these years. It's been a wonderful experience. I, it would take me a long time to tell you about it, but I'd like to tell you a little bit. Um, 
Maccabean games are held every four years, and the word Maccabea, some pronounce it Mac Maccabia. They're held every four years, uh, and all other games that you hear about are called Maccabi games. There's only one Maccabea, and that's in Israel every four. Uh, we have the JCC Maccabi game. Some of you have heard about that. It's in partnership with Maccabi World Union. It's in partnership with the JCC and Maccabi USA. And we've had events for the last, since 1982, for thousands and thousands of Jewish kids across, excuse me, across <coughs> North America. And their experiences have been unbelievable. Many of them have gone on to the Maccabea Games. One of them sitting here tonight. Um, the Maccabi World Union is located in Ramat Gan. We have representation in 80 countries around the world. It's probably sometimes called a well-kept secret, but we're 80 countries all over. You can go anywhere, anywhere, and you'll find friends from Maccabi in any section of the world. We, the last games in, 2000, in 2017, there were 10,000 Jewish athletes participating. And I want to say that many times we have athletes who come to Israel and we, they're so-called technically Jewish, but when they leave, they always have a Jewish heart. They become, many of them become involved in community. They become community leaders. It's such a special organization. We have hundreds of thousands of members across the world. We not only have the Maccabea Games, but we have the European Games. We have the Pan Am Maccabi Games in all, all over South America. Two years ago, in Germany, we had the Pan Am, we had the Maccabi, European Maccabi Games. And where Hitler once stood, with Nazi swastikas all over the place, we had thousands and thousands of young Jewish athletes assembled at that place, and there is Israeli flags in every spot where there was a Nazi flag before. It was so very, very special. Just, I can't say enough about the Maccabi organization. It is something very special. Anthony, I'm going to talk about him in a minute. We'll talk about it as well. Uh, if you get a chance, the next games are in 2021. I'll leave in about three weeks again. I'm more in honorary positions now. Thank God we have some younger people involved in our organization. But we have meetings in and Ramat Gan, and the meetings look like they look, I don't only want to use the word look like the UN, uh, and we have people from all different countries speaking different languages, we have people interpreting, and this is the preparation time. As soon as the last games are over, we start preparing for the next games. But what we're about, sports, are a means to an end. We have some wonderful athletes. We've had people like Mark, Mark Spitz over there, many athletes over the years, but sports are a means to an end. The main purpose of Maccabi is to instill a feeling of Jewishness, of pride in your Jewishness. It's instilling a feeling of love for Israel. When we went over there the first time, I used to say, We love the idea of Israel, but after competing in the Maccabea games and being over there, we said at that point, we loved Israel. And we're so proud, so proud of what they've done, and every time we go there, the rabbi in Maccabi World Union, which is the parent organization of the Maccabea games, said to me last week, he said, we are a miracle. He said, you look around, you see what happened over the last years, how people tried to end our existence, and we are a miracle. And truly, we continue to be involved in the games. We 
send thousands and thousands of athletes over there every year. It changes their lives. I can assure you, it changes lives. And it's just a wonderful organization. If I had a lot of time, I'd tell you some of the stories. And at this point, I'd really like to introduce a person who epitomizes what we in Maccabi tried to do. And that is, we want to develop athletes, for sure, but we want our athletes to be involved in our community. We want them to be involved in Israel. And this has happened. It's happened in thousands and thousands of cases. Member of Parliament, Anthony Hausfather. The first time I met Anthony was in 1982. It was our first time holding the JCC Maccabi Games in Memphis, Tennessee. And there was a 12-year-old boy. I don't want to give Anthony's age away. But a 12-year-old boy in 1982. <laughs> and Anthony doesn't mind. He's very young. So he competed in those games. And he won medals. And he had a fantastic experience. And Anthony ultimately went on and I'm not going to tell too much of it, because he's going to tell it. He ultimately went on to become a competitor in the Maccabee Games in 2013 and in 2017. And I'm sure we'll see him back in 2021. And one of the key things is, is that Anthony has given back so much to our community, to Canada. Uh, he was the mayor of Cote St. Luke for many years. Now is an outstanding member of parliament. And that's what we're about. We want our athletes to be involved, to be good citizens of Canada, to love Israel, to have pride in their Jewishness. And I have some other stories I could tell you perhaps after, but Anthony, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce you and have you come and say a few words. Guys, it's great to uh, it's great to be here to talk about an organization that I love. Um, it's great to be here with Consul General David Levy. Uh, last night we were at the Shar, uh, we were at I was going to say the Shar. We were at the Standish and Portuguese Synagogue, which was celebrating its 250th anniversary. And even though this synagogue is only 135, it is just as venerable. And I love being a temple because all of the warmth and all of the love that's instilled here and the equality in the room is something that I really, really believe in, and I think it encompasses the Maccabea movement, which is really the largest Jewish event that is not religious-based in the entire world. It's where 10,000 Jews come together, whether you're Orthodox or Reform or secular or traditional, whether you're a man or a woman, whatever country you come from, and you get a chance to do what you love, which is compete at sports. Maccabea started because we wanted to defy ancient stereotypes. There's a lot of ancient stereotypes that Israel defies, that Jews can't be warriors, that Jews can't do agriculture, and one of the stereotypes that Maccabea founders wanted to defy was that Jews aren't good at sports. Some of us actually believe that's true, it's not true. From the first Olympics in 1896, when Alfred Flato won gold medals in gymnastics for Germany, until these Olympics, you have Jewish gold medal winners at every Olympic Games. In swimming, I need only point out Mark Spitz, Jason Lezak, who swam that anchor leg to allow Mark Sp uh, Michael Phelps to win his eight gold medals in Beijing. Uh, Lenny Kraselberg, Anthony Irving. Uh, there have been Jewish swimmers on every Olympic team going back, you know, since 1896. So when I got involved in swimming, uh, I hadn't known that when I was a little kid. But I was really happy to learn when I was 11 years old that there was such a thing as uh, the Maccabea uh, Games and, and, and that there were North American Maccabea Championships that I could actually go to. And that, that is where I met Roy, who was a, an incredible chef de mission um, at those first games in Memphis. And what I found when I've been in Israel, when you walk into the stadium and you see 10,000 Jewish athletes and all of these spectators, coming from all over the world, 
You never feel more Jewish, and you never feel more Canadian. The pride in representing your country in an international competition is something that I don't think I could ever feel replicated in any other way. I would say it's the equal sentiment of when I, as a member of parliament, go and represent Canada in a Commonwealth summit, or in a summit of world, world uh, organizations. I feel pride in my country, and that was a place where I felt such pride in my country. And one, one of the things that made me feel even more proud was when the Prime Minister came on the screen uh, to congratulate the Canadian team. And people from across the world would talk to me at these games, because the Prime Minister mentioned me in the video, and sort of made me a mini-celebrity at the games, and they would tell me how, in their countries, it was so different being Jewish, and it's true. Being Jewish in Canada and the United States and maybe Australia is incredibly different than being Jewish in any other country in the world. Where when it comes to Israel, our Jewish community can be very demanding and demands that our government unequivocally support Israel and vote against anti-Israel resolutions in the UN. When you talk to Jews from most countries, they don't want their government to talk about Israel at all because they're afraid it'll increase anti-Semitism domestically. And it makes you realize how lucky we are as a Jewish community to live in Montreal, in Quebec, and in Canada. And the honor of swimming in those games and winning medals in the last two Maccabea was again incredible because you get to compete in state-of-the-art technology, an amazing fast pool, and you get to compete against really high-level athletes from around the world. Why do I train for two hours every day? Well, because of the joy of actually being able to compete. Now, I don't want to I'm, Roy, I'm going to tell some secrets. I, I don't want to lie to you. The Maccabee Games is not perfect by any means. I'm sure Roy will tell you that. It's as if the Olympic Games were held in exactly the same place every four years, and they never learned the lessons of what went wrong the last time, and they keep repeating them. One of the things that I first noticed when I arrived in 2013 was we got to the chaos of Ben Gurion Airport, as Lisa was mentioning, and you come out. And there are Maccabee athletes from all of these countries that are arriving in huge waves. And there's like a hundred buses waiting to take us to the different places in Israel where we're staying because sports are happening in different locations in the country. But there's no sign on any bus telling you where that bus is going. So you literally have to stop at every bus and ask, where are you going? And the driver usually doesn't speak English. They usually speak only Russian. So, <laughs> it was quite, quite the effort. And then we get on the bus with the Russian team, and they pull out vodka on the bus, and they're all drinking as we head toward the hotel, which again reminds you that Jews, no matter what country in the world you live in, take on the characteristics of your home country as much as you take in characteristics of being Jewish. I thought I'd share, um, to, to end, one last story, which I think talks about the fun and the chaos in the Maccabea Games. So, in 2013, I trained for the pool and I swim in the pool and, and I was really, really thrilled at how I had done in 2013. I had won six medals in the pool and I was very confident and they said, do you want to do the open water swim, which happens up north? And, 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 I, and I sort of said, well, I've never done an open water swim other than in a short triathlon before, but sure, why not? So they told us, well, the swim happens very early in the morning because it's very, very hot in Israel. So it's at 6.30, so you have to be up at 3 in the morning to get on the bus. It was the only bus that came on time of the entire Maccabee Games. <laughs> so we get on the bus at 3 o'clock, and we load up and we head up to Tiberias for the open water swim. And we get there and there's a big sign saying, swim, 11.30. <laughs> and basically we wait like hours. And, 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 and again, they had no changing rooms. They had three porta potties for thousands of people. It was one of the most interesting experiences I've ever had. Then they start making these announcements. You know, um, you need to have a bathing cap for the race or you would be disqualified. Now, normally for open water swims, they give out bathing caps, but here they weren't. So you had athletes from around the world running around the beach trying to borrow bathing caps from old grandmothers with flowers on them. <laughs> and then they make another announcement. You need to have the correct number or you would be disqualified. So everybody's running around like to put their numbers on and they're writing their numbers. They write the numbers on your arm, on your arm, on your arm, on your arm, on your leg, on your back. Everywhere, there's numbers everywhere. Then like 10 minutes later, 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have given out the wrong numbers. <laughs> if you are wearing the wrong number, you will be disqualified. <laughs> so people are running around looking for makeup remover and to, to take off the numbers. Oh. And then, then, then they say, you know, athletes, you should all come to this place to hear the instructions for the open water swim. So this little lady gets up on a chair, literally she was a little woman, she gets up on a chair and she spends 20 minutes barking out in Hebrew what we're supposed to do. 80% of the people there, 90% couldn't understand a word she said. So then she gets off and leaves. The American and Australian coaches go crazy. Another guy comes and he goes, I'm very sorry for my colleague. You will go on the race. You start at the dock. You go here, 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 here. Thank you very much. He literally said it in 10 seconds. So, I mean, the, the, this is just a small example of the mirth that you can have. But in the end result, the joy of competing, the fun that you have, it's just part of that organized chaos. It's one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. And I strongly encourage each and every one of you who love sports to get involved and maybe to start training and go to the next Maccabea Games. You never know. I mean, Lisa, for example, you may find the sport that you love that you are a world-class athlete. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. So, in, in the end result, I'm, I'm so glad to share my experience with Maccabea with you. I loved it. I think it's a great organization. And uh, I'm really, really proud to be a Maccabee alumni. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. After listening to Anthony, I, uh, now I know why I play basketball. <laughs> it was great. Um, the next speaker. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the story because she's going to tell the story. The Bugayev family, Judith Bugayev, uh, their son Alex played basketball for Canada in 1997. And for the first time in our history, we won a gold medal. And I'll have a few things to say after, but Judith, please come up and talk about how you became involved in your experiences in Maccabee. I just stole my punchline. <laughs> it's worth repeating. So our family's connection to the Maccabee Games is tied to uh, the 1997 and 2005 games when our son Alex played basketball for Canada. I want to tell you a little bit about the background that led to his participation, and especially I'd like to share with you what the games meant to us, to Alex and to the rest of the family. We have three children, two sons and a daughter, and Alex is the one who turned out to be the athlete particularly athletic, and he also turned out to be particularly tall, even for our family. So that doesn't quite jive with his choice when he started high school in seventh grade. He went out for the ping pong team. <laughs> <laughs> However, in eighth grade, he thought he would try out basketball, and uh, he was good. And he got noticed. In fact, he was recruited for the Quebec provincial team when he was still in high school in his last year. So that meant in the spring, of his last year, I started chauffeuring him from 12 of the year to the McGill team three times a week. That was when it kind of started. Um, where am I now? Right. So it was the Quebec provincial coach who also coached at McGill who told Alex about the possibility for Jewish athletes, in case he was Jewish, he was, to play for the Maccabea Games. Um, let's see, first he went off to uh, Collège Montmorency, and Collège Montmorency won the national championship at the collegiate level when Alex was playing. Then Alex was recruited by the basketball coach at Rice University in Houston. He came back after his freshman year to play for coach John Dorr, the coach at Concordia, and join the Maccabea team. I was talking to Alex, oh, before I get to that part, uh, it was Alex's first trip to Israel. And it turns out it was Canada's first time to win gold in basketball. So um, I'm told it was the first time and the last time. It was the only time the gold went to any country other than Israel or Canada. So Alex came home with wonderful memories, and he also came home with a mouth 
Valuable Player Award that yeah. year. Yeah. So I was talking with Al on the phone about his memories, and he told me that what struck him most, what he still remembers all these years later, is the overriding sense of purpose. He could feel it in the games. Of course, he already knew what it meant to play on a sports team. You get the picture. He'd been playing sports for a long time. Uh, say, Jeff. Um, but he said that at Maccabea, it was different. It started with practice in Montreal that summer before they left for Israel. There was a member of the team who was a lawyer. He came up from Miami to play on the team. And somebody 38 years old who had a career, who would take time away from work, time away from his family, that really impressed us. Because this was a real grown-up, not a college kid playing college sports. Mm -hmm. Something else was that as soon as they landed at Ben Gurion, they were taken immediately to the hotel. That wasn't your usual uh, away game mm -hmm. kind of trip. So um, that was Ben Gurion. He said he could feel it, that all the athletes and the fans who were participating in the games were there for something bigger than competition. He felt very, very moved to be part of so many Jews coming together from all over the world. Alex played professional basketball in Europe for a few years after graduation, so he was very happy to be able to play for the Maccabea Games again in 2005. This time, they didn't make it even to the semifinals, so he was able to see Israel, which he didn't get to do the first time around, and he loved it. When he came back, he made the rest of us want to see Israel, too. His younger brother, Nick, studied on an Ulpan program uh, at the Kibbutz for five months, and Alve and I went on the mission, the temple mission with Rabbi Lerner. We've been back twice since then. <coughs> So I want to thank you, Roy, and all the other volunteers, all the other people who are so dedicated to the Maccabee Games for making it all possible. I have the pleasure now, we're going to hear two more voices. One of them will be mine, transmitting someone else's. But I have the great pleasure of calling Heidi Hollinger up to share her son Lucas' story. And I realized, uh, what a wonderful coincidence, David Mizrafi is sitting beside Heidi. David competed in tennis at the Maccabea Games in 2005, and Luca competed in tennis at the Maccabea Games in 2017. I could do that for you, Joanne, or you caught it there. Are you happy with it there? Um, I've got it there. Okay, sure. Um, I'll open it. Thank you. Can you hear me? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you, Rabbi, for having me come read Luca's um, testimony about the Maccabee Games. Um, I was also there. I was lucky to be there. Not that I got to see much of Luca because they kept the, the, the kids in, you know, in their Olympic village. And the parents were not allowed, really, well, they weren't allowed to go anywhere near the Olympic village. And we got to see them before and after games. But they... The kids didn't want to have much to do with us because they were having such a good time with their friends. So, um, so Luca, well, I'm going to read it, so you, I won't have to explain very much. Uh, Luca wrote this from Havana, where he's studying right now at the International School in grade 11. So this is my Maccabee journey for Rabbi Freshko. Hello, everyone. My name is Luca Hollinger, and I was the captain of the Canadian Junior Tennis Team for the 20th Maccabee Games last summer in Israel. I'm sorry I couldn't make it to the ceremony due to my studies abroad in Havana, but below is a little summary of my experience. I was introduced to Maccabea by my good friend Sarah Levy. She was training with a small group of Jewish tennis players every Sunday at Nuns Island Tennis Club in Montreal to prepare for the 20th Maccabea Games. Knowing that I was Jewish, she invited me to come and train with these players. I trained and played with this group for about five months until it was time to try out for the team. Six males and six females between the ages of 12 and 18 would be chosen to represent Canada in the summer of 2017 in Haifa, Israel. There was a tournament which took place in Toronto in the fall of 2016 to decide who would make the team. The best Jewish tennis players in Canada would gather up in Toronto to fight for these 12 available spots. I had been training in Sparitude, in the Sparitude program, he was at College de Montréal. 
uh, for two years, and so he was, uh, sorry, uh, at Programme Collège de Montréal two years prior, so I was ready to compete. I made the team, and so did Sarah, and we celebrated by customizing matching tennis shoes online with our names on them. <laughs> and then we found out the price of the trip. <laughs> I don't know if I can say this in Senegal. Right? Oh, yeah, I wasn't sure either. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> that was definitely not what we expected. So my mom and I started campaigning. Our goal was $12,000. We managed to raise the money in about three to four months. $8,500 to cover my trip, and the rest we donated to, Mac to Maccabea for students in need. And then I was ready to go. So my, um, Sarah's mom, who is, by the way, like my second mom, drove Sarah and I to Toronto for a team meetup and pre-tournament training just before we left for Israel. I met the team, really nice people. The team was quite spread from around Canada, and uh, uh, around Canada. The team really bonded and had great energy. We left to Israel and we went on a tour of the country organized by Maccabea for the entire junior delegation before the tournament. Four hour, four hour drives, eight hour walks, zero hours sleep. <laughs> we went to the Dead Sea, luckily I didn't drown. It was crazy and intense and I loved it. We went to Jerusalem and many other sacred places. I learned so much about the Jewish culture and religion, so much that I would never have been able to see if I didn't go. The opening ceremony was like a movie, the, Oli the Olympics. It was like something out of a dream. The whole Canadian delegation walking out in an arena filled with 95,000 yelling moms, dads, Israelis, my mom, probably even louder than a whole section, and others. <laughs> the team became tighter and tighter as the tournament drew closer. As the captain of the tribe, I had to spread good vibes, even though I was super stressed. The tournament started and everybody passed the first round. I didn't have to play because I got a bye, which is a free pass to the second round due to the amount of points I had. I won my second match versus a Mexican. <laughs> I won my second match versus a Mexican with crazy Mexican parents who couldn't stop yelling at me. <laughs> it wasn't easy with the boiling sun and the 42 degrees temperature Celsius. Out of 150 players, I ended up top 30, which wasn't bad, not what I was hoping for, but I was still happy. To sum it up, my three week experience, to sum up my three week experience, I really enjoyed myself, learned many values and qualities, and hand washed a lot of socks. <laughs> I recommend this experience to anybody who is interested in challenging themselves, watching high quality level sports, and participating in the second biggest sporting event in the world. Thank you very much. And it's signed, it's Luca, which is his stage name, because Luca just released an album, apart from being a tennis player, and apart from being in grade 11 uh, in Havana, he just released an album available on Spotify, um, and uh, Apple Music, and all the different uh, uh, podiums, um, called uh, Second Floor Feelings by It's Luca, which is a little bit of a clan de, um, a wink at Suzanne Vega if, uh, you know, for, for this generation of people. And, um, and uh, I want to say I'm really proud of Luca. He, he had the best time of his life in Israel. Uh, he met such great people. Um, he had a girlfriend over there from Toronto that was also on the tennis team. And, uh, and it really brought him closer to, um, you know, to his Jewish identity. It's something he will never forget, and, and as he described, um, and as Anthony described, it, it was so incredible to be in that stadium and to see um, all the different, like they, on the screen, they would, they would flash the flag of the country that was coming up next, and it was so exciting to see, um, to see that, uh, I was out with the Cuban delegation. Um, there, some, some delegation didn't really even know that the Jewish people lived in these countries, and it was so incredible just to be surrounded um, by, by fellow Jews uh, from so many different places. Um, uh, while I'm up here, I just wanted to mention that um, there's an exhibit going on right now called Shalom Montreal. Yeah. And I don't know if you've seen it, but I met our, our Consul General, our Israeli Consul General there last week at the grand opening of the, of the exhibit. It's a fantastic exhibit about the uh, contribution of, um, of Jewish 
for the Jewish community to Montreal. It's fantastic. It's our contribution um, in culture, architecture, health, sciences, uh, commerce, bagels. And, uh, and I want to encourage you all to go on the uh, ambassadrice of the exhibit. And uh, you're all welcome. It's a pretty fabulous lineup of people. I will um, share just a teeny, teeny bit from Chloe Gordon, who played basketball in um, not this game, but the last one in 2013. She also happens to be my next door neighbor. There are always many basketballs in our shared back area. My <laughs> You know, two foot nothing. Alice has been trained by Chloe to try and reach the net. Um, but Chloe, who also grew up in this congregation, she shares this uh, stories about having those the access to the elite facilities and what it was like to train and to practice with everyone else who was there. And she ends with this wonderful anecdote about how, when the American team beat us decisively in the gold medal game, we took a combined team picture with them. We didn't know how the gold medalists would feel about taking a picture with the silver medalists. But then their leading scorer exclaimed, it's okay, because we're all Jews. That sentiment equal eloquently summed up my three-week Maccabiya Israel experience. And I think it speaks volumes that she's not here tonight, because she's, she's back there now. Now, I want to say just a word, and then I'm going to ask us to, to rise for Hatikva, for the Israeli National Anthem, and then call on our Consul General to say a few words as we come to the end of our service. Um, you know, Israel, like every country in the world, and more so because, you know, Israel is a complicated place. I'm feeling that about Israel right now. I'm feeling it about Jerusalem right now with Jerusalem Day coming up, which in some ways is a wonderful celebration and in other ways points to the real flashpoints of tension in the city. And I know that so often when we see the news coming from the Middle East in general and in Israel in particular, that it's, that it's often troubling. I had a congregate call just just this week to say, hey, I'm planning to go to Israel for two weeks. What, what does the rabbi say about what's going on there now? Should I go or should I not go? And, and Sally, my wonderful assistant who spent years living in kibbutz, just told her to call the Canadian consulate and then go. Um, but there is so much that is a source of, of concern or contention. And I think sometimes, especially, and I'll speak for a younger generation, we don't get that same sense of accomplishment and excitement and pride. Not that that should let us ignore the difficulties, but that it should remind us of some of the, the mission and the values that created Israel in the first place and that continues to, to sustain and inspire it. And so it's really that piece that I wanted us to bring forward tonight. And I'm so grateful to Roy and for everyone who took part for, for helping us bring that forward. Not to say it's the whole picture. No one story or even five stories are the full picture but to say that there is this dream still and this vision of something extraordinary of people coming together from around the world uh, to compete and also to connect and to share a vision, as was said, of being part of something larger than oneself. And so with that in mind, I invite you to rise for Hatikva and to join with us on page 374.
included, and I invite up our Consul General, David Lett. <laughs>
close this part of our evening and of our service with some words about, Maka, about Jewish Olympics. Um, and I thank Rabbi Greenspan for bringing this to my attention. It's from a piece called Olympics and the Jewish Pursuit of Excellence by Rabbi Rebecca Stern. And she concludes her piece uh, leading into the high holidays in her case as follows. So we return to the realm of the Olympics. Olympic competitors are physical symbols of excellence. And we, as members of a people who place such value on the pursuit of excellence, can find renewed inspiration and motivation in their tireless drive, their constant self-reflection, learning, and self-improvement. As we sit in awe of their achievements, let us also be moved to emulate the disciplined qualities of these athletes. For if we are so moved, we too may accomplish our own new personal best as we aim for faster, higher, stronger. I invite you to rise for a lay new 282 de son capovent. in Jerusalem and New York and Cincinnati in LA, really spanning a lot of the breadth of the Jewish world. Um, he died tragically last Saturday, and many of us emerged from Shabbat to that news. He was one of Rabbi Greenspan's campers when she was on staff at Eisner. Uh, for me, he was a teacher, the president of the college, and I had the honor of serving on his rabbinic council. Uh, and a friend. He came and spoke here, some of you may remember, back last fall, in, in the fall of 2016, and shared really his, his erudition, his wisdom. He was an engineer by training, and he uh, often reminded me of my grandfather, who was an engineer, and said, there's no problem that has, that there's no problem without a solution, and I think that Aaron lived by that, too, even as he was grappling with some of the most complex problems and questions of the Jewish world. Um, you know there are those shows where you can phone a friend 
He was my ringer rabbi um, <laughs> when I was on my sabbatical month in January and I, I was working on a text and I had a question, I shot Aaron an email and with all the things on his plate he, he wrote me right back and then came to me with a question about Canadian Ketubot, which I was happy to be able to answer for him. He was, um, he was a consummate mensch. He had a tremendous sense of humor. Uh, he, he happens to have a, a sister and a sister-in-law who both are rabbis, and when his sister, Rabbi Melinda Pankin, was speaking at his funeral this week, which Rabbi Greenspan and I both watched, she shared how when he would spell his name, you know how you're on the phone and you have to tell someone <coughs> the letters of your last name, he would say, P is in pterodactyl. <laughs> K is in knee. He just had a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful sense of humor. Um, but he also had more energy and enthusiasm, whether it was for tackling a challenge or having a vision for the reform movement or um, teaching a text that I've ever seen. There was, there was some laughter at his funeral amidst the grief of... Um, how few people had read his book, The Rhetoric of Rabbinic Innovation, and I was sitting in my chair at my desk thinking, but I read it and I loved it. He, he and I shared <coughs> a, a love of Talmud, but he, he taught like nobody I've ever seen or known because he always had such absolute joy in sharing the discovery of a text from thousands of years ago and what it would have to teach us today. Um, it was a tremendous loss and, and <coughs> You know, like many of us perhaps with the loss, you spend the week being busy and pushing things away and it's only now in this service that I've really had the time to reflect and feel how, how deep it goes. But the amazing thing with Aaron is that there are thousands of people feeling that way because of him and because of his <coughs> loss this week. Um, I want to share one more piece, which is that Aaron was a pilot. He loved flying. And he died tragically in a crash of a small plane that he was piloting um, in, in Westchester, near Westchester, where he lived. And <coughs> Aaron was very much a Klal Yisraelnik. He believed in connecting with Jews of all backgrounds and all stripes. Um, but with a, a kind of insensitivity which was remarkable but perhaps predictable, um, when the news came out of his death, there were voices from the Orthodox Jewish world that said, well, what kind of rabbi is it that flies on Shabbat anyway? And I thought to myself, very proudly, a reform rabbi who has an understanding that Shabbat is about seeing the beauty of creation, and it's not always all about the letter of the law, much though we learn it and love it and respect it. Because when Aaron was up in the sky, he was that much closer to humanity, and he was that much closer to God. And he taught us, even in, even in that. Um, so I want to share with you just a few words from Rabbi David Stern, who spoke at his funeral, who delivered one of the eulogies. And I think this is important to share with you as we come to Kaddish, and, and thank you for, for giving the space for this, um, because it's a loss, clearly, to those of us who knew him, but really to our whole community. So Rabbi Stern writes, I know the tragic circumstances of Aaron's death might make us reticent to speak of his passions, but that would not be fair to him. He loved sailing, and he loved flying. He had a thing for the sky. He had a thing for the compass of the stars. He had a thing for the water and the wind. The Messenger's Berkshire home on the lake and cottage my family rents are literally a five-minute drive from each other and about 20 minutes by sailboat or kayak. I cannot recall a single time that Aaron drove. I really believe he was most at home in the sky and on the water. They were his poetry, the places where his intellect and his sense of wonder could dance. He has fallen from a Sabbath sky, and our hearts are broken. But how he loved a Sabbath sky. And so on this Shabbat, we honor him, we honor that Sabbath sky, and in that way too may we be inspired to reach higher. If there's anyone you're remembering the Shabbat as I read their name, please I invite you to rise in honor of their memory and to add a name if you have one as well. The Shabbat we remember Nadine Litwack, Sidney Cowan, Adam Steinberg, Marilyn Minoski, and our teacher, our rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pankin.
We also remember yard sites this Shabbat. We remember Sabina Abramowitz, Lillian Elisi, Alexander Alkali, Nathan Bacall, Rose Bergman, Dora Berlin, Dora Blank, Chaim J. Bornstein, Charlotte A. Bornstein, Irving Cheroff, Dorothy Mark Shorlton, Benjamin Cohen, Mary Diskin, Harry Dogman, Jonah Alexander Felsen, Hirsch Fenster, Ethel Fox, Joseph Frankel, Anita Friedman, Arnold Friedman, Isaac Friedman, Emmanuel Galerkin, Stuart Bruce Gertzman, Libby Lithwick Glue, Goldie Gold, Augusta Lazarus Goldstein, Julius Goldstein, Jean Greenberg, Samuel D. Gross, Stanley Handman, Hyman Hirschhorn, Tanya Balasiano Hodney, Edward Eichmann, Nora Eichmann, Mary Berkovich Isaac, Dr. Philip Joseph, Leah Lax, Jonathan Lee, Simon Levin, Sally Froelich Levinson, Max Mendelssohn, Lionel Miller, Doris Minden, Morris Mursky, Malka Friedman Pass, Mary Pearson, Dr. Samuel Paul, Alexander Puritz, Jack Reisler, Martin Reisman, Max Wilhelm Rothschild, Jack Redner, Max Siegel, Emma Shane, Yeda Shapiro, Max Schrage, Robert Silver, Arthur Simon, Isidore Simpson, Anita Singer, Eric M. Smith, Grace Smith, Hattie Smith, Morley Sobka, Effie Solomon, Rose Spiegel, Dr. Anna Stearns, Aaron Adolf Sternberg, Arlene Tinkler, Boleslaw Ufa, Claire Marie Vinet, Max Wagner, Al Weitzenfeld. Are there names to add? Nelson, My grandfather. Lily Fortin, Deutsch, my mother. <coughs> May their memories be for blessing, each and every one. Page 294, the song rise from Adam. <laughs>
Aaron, among many other qualities, had a deep love for Israel. And when he visited this congregation, a love for all of us here, and for this reformed Jewish outpost in Montreal. And so I think he would have appreciated this evening. Page 